Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi, and today I want to talk about product reviews. I'm not reviewing an actual product, I just want to talk about my process and how I approach it. So first of all, what is a product review? Well, I actually went and looked this up because I wanted to make sure that my definition was the same as the standard accepted definition. But a product review is content, could be a website article or a printed article or a blog post or a video or whatever. Um, that's designed to give you information about a product so that you can make a better purchasing decision. Um, ideally, a reviewer is going to be unbiased. They're going to tell you good and bad things about the product. And ideally, the reviewer doesn't have any stake in whether or not you actually buy the product. Like, if I review something and you tell me you bought it, I might be like, oh, cool, you know, because I like that model too. But I don't really get anything out of it other than maybe just thinking that it's cool that you did that. Um, so that's kind of, you know, where I'm coming from. I try to be the unbiased reviewer. Um, so I think it's also important then to talk about what is an ad. So an advertisement is some content that's trying to get you to buy something. So it's a little bit of a different mindset. The ad is trying to persuade where the product review is just trying to provide information. And I think it's important to make a distinction. Now the Gray area comes when you have product reviewers who are getting paid. And by getting paid, I mean they could be getting money, they could be getting free merchandise, uh, whatever the deal is. Um, I think that tends to lead to a temptation to skew the, the content a little more toward the advertisement rather than a pure product review. So now I have taken some free models. I always tell you when that happens. Um, but, you know, when, when I do, I do it with the understanding that I'm going to do the review exactly the same way as I would when uh, I buy something. And I do buy the vast majority of the models that I review, um, you know, with my own money. I pay the same prices that you guys would. Uh, I don't get any special deals from anybody. Um, you know, I look for bargains, but, you know, it's nothing that anyone else couldn't do if they shopped around. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, everybody was on the same page with the definitions. And one of the reasons I took this up, started doing this on YouTube, was kind of um, a feeling on my part that there are certain publications that no longer really do unbiased reviews. Um, certain publications, and I don't know the ins and outs of the magazine business, so, you know, um, but it does seem like sometimes people are a little bit maybe afraid of losing sponsors. Um, that's just a guess on my part. I, like I said, I don't really know the ins and outs of the magazine business, but it's hard these days, uh, at least in certain publications, to find a review that says anything bad about a product. And not that I'm out to trash things, but I do want to be honest, and I, I think I give credit where credit is due and criticism where criticism is due. So this is an issue of Model Railroader from March 1980. It's going back a bit. Um, I wanted to read a couple excerpts from a review in their trade topics section, which is what they used to call their product reviews. So this review is of a brass Union Pacific CA-11 caboose. This is on page 38 if anyone has the magazine and wants to look. Um, or if you have the deal with, with Kalmbach where you can go online and read the magazines. Um, anyway, it's a compact body caboose from Overland Models, it's a brass caboose, and at the time it retailed for $59, um, which if you do the inflation probably is a lot more in today's money. But in any case, uh, I'll read you uh, one excerpt here. The CA-11 model incorporates a number of eye-catching details. The compact body leaves deep porches at each end, and the model reproduces the interesting array of water and fuel tanks, collision posts, and hand grabs found on the real cars. The trucks represent the prototype's national swing motion, roller bearing type, and one sports an axle driven generator. So that's good information, right? It's very positive. It's saying that this car's got good detail. So let me read you another excerpt from the same article. The nickel plated brass wheel sets have RP25 flange and tread contours, but all but four check too narrow on the NMRA standards gauge. Adjusting the wheel sets with a wheel puller would be simple, but because the bolsters are soldered to the side frames, removing and replacing the wheel sets could be troublesome. The car rolls about as freely as most brass models with straight journals, which is to say that it's only minimally acceptable. So that's saying basically that if you want to actually run this car, you're probably going to have to do some work to it. 
So that's a pretty fair review. It's telling you the good things about it and it's telling you the bad things about it. So sometimes I get some comments about my scoring system. Uh, one of the reasons I use a scoring system is to try to enforce consistency. It's very important to me to try to be as consistent as possible from one review to another. Um, now I'm not saying I'm perfect, but that's kind of the goal. Um, you know, if you go back through my body of work, you could probably find a place where I might have let something slide with one model that I dinged another one for. Uh, it may have happened, I don't know. But in any case, I'm striving for as much consistency as I can manage. And I think the score helps to facilitate that. Um, I do the reviews in a very formulaic way on purpose because, again, it enforces consistency. It makes me have to talk about the same things for every model. And that way, you know, if you're trying to compare models, you can kind of, you know, get a better idea of how one stacks up against another. So I think really the score is not the end all and be all of the review. It's really to provide information, like I said at the beginning. Um, but the score, I think, is a relative measure of quality. So you could probably infer that if a car got 95 points, it's probably a little better than a car that got 85 points. Maybe it just has fewer issues. Maybe the couplers weren't at the wrong height or whatever. Um, but you know, you can kind of use it in that in that context as just using it as a relative measure of quality. So one thing I'll say about the scores also is I think um, the fact that getting a perfect score, which has happened maybe half a dozen times, I think, on, the, on this channel since I've been doing these reviews, um, it means something. You know, it's like that's kind of hard to do. So when you see a car that gets, uh, or a locomotive that gets a perfect score, that actually is like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, at least that's how it seems to me. Um, anything that scores in the 90s, honestly, is, is doing really well, in my opinion. Um, if I gave high praise without criticism to everything that came across my workbench, then it really wouldn't mean much. You know, I have uh, one of my favorite uncles, he's since uh, passed on, but um, my aunt used to say he was no judge of food because uh, he liked just about anything you put in front of him. Um, <laughs> so. It was like he was not the world's best food critic because he would just say, oh, this is great, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, um, you know, I, I, as much as I love trains and, you know, would like to tell you they're all great, I feel like a, I have an obligation to, you know, tell you when something's not. So before we move on, I want to say one more thing about my methodology, and that is I do write scripts. I write up the review like a little article before I um, actually start filming or during the filming process. And I think that helps to keep me on point. It helps to keep me from re, uh, repeating myself too much. And it also, I think, keeps the review fairly concise. Um, I know that for myself, I'm more inclined to watch short YouTube videos than long ones. So, you know, I try to keep that in mind when I'm making them. So at the beginning of the review, I always go over the price of the model. And um, there's actually usually two prices. There's the MSRP, which is if you're not familiar, um, is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. And then there's the actual price paid. Um, oftentimes the MSRP is a fiction. Uh, most of the time you can find stuff at a discount if you shop around. I know there are some stores that try to charge the MSRP, but a lot of times you can shop around and find stuff at, typically for trains, maybe a 10 to 15% discount, maybe sometimes a little more if you, you know, get a good deal somewhere. Um, and this is something that I wanted to do even before I had my own channel, um, but I kind of was overruled. But I think it's really actually more important to talk about the actual price paid because that's probably what people can expect to pay themselves or at least close to that. Um, I know like if you buy something online from certain manufacturers direct, a lot of them have an MSRP and then they have the price you're actually gonna pay, but that's, that's really a fiction. It's just to make you feel like you're getting a deal. Um, so I think it's important to really, you know, talk about the actual price. Another thing I started doing when I started to do reviews on this channel was to talk about packaging. Um, I really think it's important because today's models have a lot of detail typically, and you want a box that's not going to make those details break off. Um, you know, I look at these old boxes like this Kato GP35, um, you know, these had fairly rigid foam inside and you know, it's okay for the model as it comes out of the box because these models didn't have a lot of extra stuff on them to get knocked off. But if I tried to put one of my super detailed GP35s in one of these boxes, it would get wrecked. 
So, you know, this is not a good box to reuse once I've done my detailing on this model. Um, if you're like me, you may have a lot of trains in storage. If you've seen the Box of the Month shows, you know I have quite a few trains um, still in their original boxes awaiting the layout that I'm hoping to build eventually. Um, you know, it's, so it's important to me that the box is, you know, adequate and will keep the model protected and keep all those details protected. So also, it's part of what you're paying for when you buy it. So I really think it's important to talk about that as part of the review. So if a model loses points in this category, it's usually because it arrives damaged or because something fell off or because the box design is really poor. So in the prototype accuracy section, I try to compare the model to the real thing and see how close it is. Uh, there's basically two components to that. One is to try to research the real uh, object, whether it's a locomotive or a freight car or whatever, and get as much information as I can about it. And the other is to try to find photos of that thing and then compare the model to the photos. Um, now, depending on what it is, I may have more or less information available to me. If it's a Southern Pacific diesel, I've got a lot of books. Um, it's a, if it's a Santa Fe diesel, I have a lot of books. Um, you know, if it's something a little more obscure, I may have to, you know, rely more on what the manufacturer uh, provides um, or what I can find online. Um, I've been collecting pictures online for about 20 years or more, so I have quite a reference library built up on the computer. And I, I use those, uh, you know, frequently. Um, got them all organized by railroad and, you know, type and, and everything. Um, and another thing I've been doing for maybe not quite as long um, is to buy slides of old, you know, old slides of trains. Because um, unfortunately, I didn't take a lot of my own pictures back in the day. So um, I do actually use those quite often as well. Um, I like the slides because I can generally blow them up bigger and get more detail out of them. But um, anyway, so I have quite a reference library made up of uh, scanned slides now too. And all of those things go into uh, the prototype accuracy section. So if a model loses points in this section, it's generally because it has something wrong with it in terms of not being accurate to the prototype. In the paint and detail category, I look at the model's paint job and how good it is and also the details that are applied to the model. Um, I try to look for how crisp the markings are. Um, this is a little N-scale car from way back in the day, and I remember, um, you know, in the old days of N-scale, all of the freight cars had slightly blurry lettering um, until microtrains came along, and then everything kind of changed for the better, um, at least slowly over time. Um, so, you know, I try to figure out that stuff, and most, most of the time these days, most of the stuff I review has pretty good paint jobs and pretty good uh, markings. You know, usually they've got things down now to the point where you can read the really tiny writing. Sometimes I need a magnifying glass, but you can read it. Um, so it's pretty good, generally. Um, if the paint is like super thick and to the point where it, you know, kind of softens all the details, I may tell you about that. But generally speaking, uh, paint is pretty good these days. Um, the other area that I look at is you know, does it have separately applied grab irons? Does it have uncoupling levers? Does it have air hoses? All those little kinds of details that people like nowadays. And I do tend, I will, I will tell you, I tend to buy cars and locomotives that have a lot of detail because that's what I like. So I don't tend to review as many uh, models that have molded on things. Um, anyway, but generally I may take points off if I feel a car has uh, miss, is missing something that other cars in the price range would have. So, um, you know, it could be that, you know, if it's a, at a certain price level and everything else in that price level has uncoupling levers and air hoses and the one I'm reviewing is missing uncoupling levers, that, that's probably a deduction. This is one area where it is a little bit subjective, but, you know, I try to do my best with it. So, standards in operation. <laughs> Uh, this is the one that I draw the most heat for, I think. Um, people think I'm too harsh or not harsh enough. I don't know. I just have to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, most of the models that I review that have couplers, uh, locomotives or rolling stock, have coupler height issues, and they tend to lose points for that. Uh, one of the things that I did do when I started my own channel was to only take 5% off for each coupler rather than 10% if either coupler was wrong, like I used to do in the when I was elsewhere. Um, so I think that's a little bit of an improvement. 
As far as why I think coupler height's important, I did a whole program on that. It's called uh, Model Building Tips Fixing Coupler Height. So if you want to watch that, um, it's here on the channel. I'm not going to rehash all that. Um, I also test wheel gauge. I think wheel gauge is probably even more important because if you have out of gauge wheels, they can cause derailments. Um, I test uh, body wobble. And I know this is, this is something I guess doesn't bother some people, but I don't like model trains that wobble because they tend to do it too fast. Um, I have seen real freight cars on, you know, real trains sway back and forth, but they tend to do it pretty slowly because, you know, a freight car is big and heavy and they just don't move fast. Whereas, uh, you know, little model trains are light and small and they tend to vibrate too fast. You know, it doesn't look right. So I'm, I'm very much about reproducing the look of the prototype in terms of how they move. So if I see something moving in an out of scale way, that bothers me. I also test the car weight. Uh, now I usually use the NMRA car weight. I know that's not the end all and be all, but I think it's a workable standard. And I don't generally take points off unless something is way off. And I, here, this is an area where I have to give allowance to open cars like flat cars or spine cars that just don't have a lot of room to add more weight. Um, sometimes those just end up being lighter than, than the recommendation. And you know, pretty much it's like add a load if you wanna you know, make it heavier. Um, so, you know, there's not much you can do with some of those. Um, and I also test, like, if it's a freight car, how free rolling it is. If it's a locomotive, I also test the operation of the lights and how much it can pull and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, this is all about the operation of the train. And, and the thing I, I want to emphasize here is it's really all about fun. Okay. All of this stuff is about having fun with the trains and trains that work properly are fun to me anyway. Um, trains that don't work properly are not so fun. So if they're coming uncoupled all the time or falling off the track, that's not as fun. And that actually can be an interest killer, especially for beginners. So I think it's really important that the trains work the way they're supposed to. So after I'd been doing reviews for a while on my channel, I came up with the rip track section. And just like a real prototype rip track, that's where I do minor repairs on the cars, basically trying to fix coupler height or wheel gauge or anything that could be done relatively quickly. I'm not gonna do major surgery on a model in this section. Um, it, you know, anything like a, if a real car on a real railroad needs to be sent to the shop, it wouldn't be sitting on a rip track. It would be, they do something else with it. Um, rip tracks are for relatively small repairs that can be done in the field. So that's kind of the approach I have here. And, and basically I'm trying to let people know like what they're in for, in terms of like, if you bought the same model you know, and your coupler height is off as well and you want to fix it, this is what you might have to do to it. This is what, how I did it. You know, you might have a different approach, but at least you can see what I did and hopefully it gives you some insight. So the my take section is where I recap the scores and give the model a letter grade and a signal rating. Um, if you're curious, uh, 90 to 100 is in the A range, 80 to 89 is the B range, uh, 70 to 79 would be in the C's, 60 to 69 is in the D's, and anything less than 60 would be an F. A and B scores get a green signal typically. Um, C and D scores would get a yellow signal. Um, and an F would get a red signal. Uh, as I'm taping this program, I have not yet given an F. I think the lowest I've given is a 65, which would be a yellow signal. So basically, the signal score has to do with my recommendation. Green would be, yeah, I think you could probably feel pretty confident if you wanted to buy this product. Yellow means that you might want to investigate the issues and decide if you want to subject yourself to that before buying the product. And red would mean I don't recommend you buy this product. Um, and that's probably as close as I would come to trying to persuade you to do something, um, you know, is to give you that buying recommendation. So when I do multiple model reviews, instead of starting with 100 points, I start with some multiple of that, depending on how many models there are. So if it's like a two car set, it would be 200 points. If it was a three car set, it would be 300. Um, and then at the end, I give you an average and then also the individual scores. And other than that, it's just like any other product review. And lately in this section, I've started to give a little bit of opinion uh, just on some general thoughts about the model. And uh, that seems to be uh, something people are liking. So I think I'll keep doing that. So something that I haven't done, but I'm kind of keeping in my back pocket is the idea of an automatic fail. And that would be if a product arrived in completely unusable condition like say a model freight car that was completely smashed or a locomotive that didn't run or something like that. 
Um, in that case, I would consider tossing out the points and just failing the model on the basis that it doesn't do the job that you bought it to do. So that's pretty much my approach to product reviews. I hope that uh, gives anybody who is curious about what I'm doing or why I do it some insight into the whole process. Anyway, if you like this video, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned and thanks for watching.